So good morning to all of you. Um, today I'm going to speak to you about mucormycosis, which is uh, a relatively uncommon uh, invasive and life-threatening disease uh, occurring in a variety of different uh, patient groups. Um, what we want to do today is to uh, address the epidemiology of mucormycosis and to understand its pathophysiology uh, in a brief sense, to be familiar with the different clinical manifestations of the disease, also uh, to address the different treatment options which are important and some of the complications and prognosis related to, to this quite devastating infection in the majority of patients. So mucormycosis was previously called zygomycosis because many of the organisms are members of the family of, of zygomycetes, but uh, in fact zygomycetes include other organisms such as Canidia bolus and Basidia bolus which are not regarded as mucormycosis, hence the change in name. And it typically occurs in immunocompromised patients or trauma patients, but also in others and particularly diabetic patients. It's usually a very aggressive, acute infection, um, can cause granuloma, but often causes necrosis of tissue. It's usually an opportunist, and there's a lot of different pathogens that are involved in uh, causing mucormycosis. What these organisms all have in common is that they can invade blood vessels, and so they can cause ne a tissue necrosis and infarction of that area, and different parts of the body are affected uh, in different patient groups. The most common is patients who get involvement of the sinuses leading to cerebral extension or oral extension in some cases, and sometimes the eye is affected or the retroorbital contents are affected. One of the key underlying characteristics of these patients is diabetes, and particularly those who have ketoacidosis, although not always, it's usually poorly controlled diabetics, and. Uh, Often, if they develop mucormycosis, they become ketotic uh, during that process. And overall, diabetes, of course, is very common across the world. So this is, as an underlying group, almost certainly the most common. It's a probably a rare infection. Um, it's thought to affect around 10,000 individuals worldwide. But in fact, a recent estimates from India suggest that it's really quite a lot more common than that. And that may be true in other countries where there's a very high incidence of diabetes. Um, as I've indicated, poorly controlled diabetes and acidosis are important underlying factors. Um, but also neutropenia and some transplant patients are also at risk. We do get infection in immunocompetent, completely normal individuals following trauma, uh, which can occur, for example, after a tornado or a tsunami or in, in the military uh, in, after bomb blasts and um, IEDs as well. There are also outbreaks and clusters of mucormycosis related to uh, hospital um, events. Um, for example, burns patients with uh, bandages with um, a fungus on them or um, um, uh, a wooden tongue depressors have also been associated with outbreaks as well. And you can also have outbreaks when the air a filtration of very immunocompromised patients is not perfect and so you get um, uh, airborne spread. Overall, the mortality is between 30 and 70 percent, so that's a pretty lethal infection. And that's despite improvement in drugs and an understanding of the disease and, and better surgery. There's a quite an interesting study from Mexico which has looked at the epidemiology, and you can see overall that there's been a rise in the number of cases documented, and that's particularly associated with diabetes, but also associated with malignancy. And of those cases, 72% were diabetic, um, and the, the uh, patients with sinusitis as the cause of the location of the disease was also found in about 75% of patients, and half the patients died. The clinical spectrum uh, is shown on this slide. So the commonest is this rhinocerebral form of disease, um, and that involves the brain, the nasal sinuses to begin with, spreading often to the brain and sometimes to the orbital contents. You can get pulmonary mucormycosis. You can get cutaneous mucormycosis. Um, less commonly, you get gastrointestinal mucormycosis, probably from the organism being in the bowel and in patients who are very ketotic or diabetic, but poorly controlled diabetes. 
and you can also have disseminated disease. And that occurs occasionally as part of a uh, very severe disease, but intravenous drug abusers occasionally inject um, mucoradies spores into themselves, for example. So the major risk factors, as I've indicated, are uncontrolled diabetes, usually with ketoacidosis, and that's particularly associated with the rhinocerebral form of disease. Um, iron chelating therapy, desferioxamine or deferioxamine therapy, is also associated particularly with disseminated disease, and it seems to allow the, the iron chelation seems to almost feed the fungus and allow the fungus to grow. And it's therefore, and that's associated with iron and aluminium overload. So patients with thalassemia or patients with um, and renal dysfunction, uh, renal failure, are particularly at risk for that. Burns are also a major risk factor, but not if handled and looked after in a very clean environment. It's usually, if there's a burns infection related to mucormycosis, it's usually a break in infection control on hospital, the hospital environment. As I've indicated, severe trauma, tornadoes, tsunamis, war, degloving injuries, injuries in motorcyclists, and so on. And sometimes protein energy malnutrition, sort of very malnourished, neglected patient, whether it's an adult or a child, is also at risk. Um, there are other forms of metabolic acidosis which can predispose the patients. Um, immunosuppressive drugs, particularly steroids uh, and um, neutropenic patients are at risk. Organ or bone marrow transplantation and neutropenia itself related to that. Uh, certain forms of malignancy are associated with mucormycosis, although it's usually the treatment of the malignancy rather than the malignancy per se. And uh, as I said, intravenous drug abuse, occasionally patients will get cere isolated cerebral mucormycosis or or very rare examples of um, endocarditis due to mucor are typically seen in drug abusers. Very premature babies and low birth weight babies uh, are, are a higher risk for gastrointestinal mucormycosis, uh, also cutaneous if there's a break in uh, the uh, environment that the newborn babies are held in. It's a rare disease in HIV AIDS, but a very severe disease in those patients, and usually they have another reason, such as diabetes or neutropenia as well. Chronic kidney disease because of the um, aluminium overload in part. Liver cirrhosis, again with iron overload and liver failure. And about 15 or 20 percent of patients just get this disease, and it isn't clear why. They're, they don't have an obvious uh, reason, such as trauma. Lots of different pathogens involved, and I'm not going to go through these in any real detail. Um, just to indicate that Rhizopus species, particularly Rhizopus aryzae, is the most common of all of them, um, and that's involved in 70% of rhinocerebral cases. Um, mucor species are also involved. Uh, they're mucor species in the mucoralis family, so it's a little confusing that, but they're, they're there. And then rhizomucor is another group of these uh, pathogens. And these are naturally found in the environment as part of bread mold uh, and on bread and other things. So they're very common in the environment, it's just they don't usually cause disease. The rarer forms of disease include apophomyces, cunghamella, what was called abscidia, now lich lichthemia, and saxonia, and some other rarer pathogens as well are implicated. And they all have certain, the one big characteristic is that they're generally wide, uh, right angle branching, not at acute angle branching, without septi, as I'll show you. So the agents of mucor are common. We probably all breathe them in every day, and usually it's not a pathogen. And just because you isolate this in the laboratory does not definitively mean that you have uh, mucormycosis. You can get patients with just growing this organism, and it isn't pathogenic in that particular patient. But obviously it needs to be taken very seriously if you do grow it. The, as I've indicated, the infections typically involve the lung, sinuses, and brain, but you can get the skin involved, and you can get the guts involved. You get invasion of blood vessels, ischemia, necrosis, and infarction of the local tissues, and the organism tends to go through these tissues fairly rapidly. Neutrophils are absolutely critical in defense, so profoundly neutropenic patients are definitively at risk. And also ketoacidosis, hyperglycemia, and hypoxia support the growth of this organism uh, very well. And ketoacidosis itself, of course, decreases inflammatory responses, 
delays the local aggregation of granulocytes and fibroblasts, and hyperglycemic patients have reduced neutrophil function as part of, their, of the neutrophil uh, response. So from a uh, clinical perspective, rhinocerebral disease, it's usually unilateral. Um, it presents with facial pain, uh, which gets increasingly severe. Usually the eye swells and you get proptosis. And you also, in association with that, have visual disturbance because the eye movements are reduced. And so you may end up with diplopia or some difficulty in um, uh, visual, uh, just visual acuity. On clinical exam, the, sometimes if it's extensive disease, you get uh, necrotic lesions on the hard palate, as in this case on the left-hand photograph here. Um, but more commonly and earlier, the nasal mucosa is involved. So if you suspect this disease, you need to have somebody look inside the nose with a rhinoscope as fast as you can, because this dusky, dark mucosa in the nasal sinuses is a major clue to this diagnosis, and you, a biopsy confirms the diagnosis. You do sometimes get this nasal congestion, you can get a black discharge, you can get acute sinusitis, and also a little bit of blood coming out of the nose, as I say, usually on one side. And of course, these are really common symptoms, uh, maybe not black discharge, but the other symptoms. So it's in the context of diabetes, in the, in the context of leukemia, where you really need to attend, have a pay rapid attention to this problem. And much later on, they will develop fever, these patients. Fever is not a prominent feature of this disease early in its genesis. So stage one, you get infection of the nasal mucosa and the sinuses. You then progresses usually to get orbital involvement, sometimes with the orbital apex syndrome, which involves where the um, optic nerve comes through the um, back of the orbital, uh, the uh, eye socket, and you get invasion of the actual um, optic nerve and the other um, the, the nerves controlling the, the movement of the eye, and you get this superior orbital fissure syndrome, which has got uh, causes diplopia and inability to move the eye, and you get proptosis with that, and if it continues to spread, you get it. Uh, cerebral involvement, which convolves directly through the ophthalmic artery, the superior orbital fissure, the cribriform plate, and, and then you get a, also a, usually a frontal lobe abscess in association with this. Now, the second most common form of disease is in the lungs, um, and this typically occurs, is not found so much in diabetic patients. Of course, it does occur in diabetic patients, but it's more commonly in um, uh, leukemia and transplant type of patients. And it may be seen in patients on voriconazole prophylaxis as well, because voriconazole doesn't work for mu against mucal mycosis. And so if you have what looks like aspergillosis in a patient on voriconazole, the likelihood is that it's going to be a mucal mycosis case. Now, they do present with fever, with cough, sometimes hemoptysis, which is usually quite mild, chest pain or chest discomfort, increasing shortness of breath, and they might have a pleural rub or, or ronchi in the, in the airway. These are features very similar to invasive aspergillosis. So you really cannot distinguish from a clinical perspective which fungus is in the lungs. And usually with this acute pulmonary mucomycosis, you get either a halo sign, which is a nodule surrounded by ground glass, or the opposite, which is shown here, which is a reverse halo sign, with, where you get this surrounding area, and then inside the ground glass type appearance, or, or ground, uh, uh, and it gives you what's called this reverse halo feature, which is a later feature, but highly distinctive for um, uh, uh, mucomycosis. And then very recently, chronic pulmonary mucomycosis has been recognized as, a, as effectively a new syndrome. Not many patients described, and it's quite difficult to diagnose because cultures are often negative from respiratory samples. But if you do grow them and you have a chronic um, in, uh, cavitary infiltrate, then that may be the diagnosis. Now, skin involvement either in burns or after trauma, uh, which are the two commonest uh, events, are, are seen in around 20% of patients with mucomycosis. So typically you have a direct invasion. Um, the, the organism is actually directly inoculated into the skin. And, um, but sometimes you have disseminated disease and you actually have uh, uh, um, lesions 
popping up in different parts of the skin where there's been no trauma. And so it's a manifestation of disseminated mucormycosis. So they have skin induration and erythema, but often this is on, not on normal skin. So it's burned skin or it's traumatized skin. And so it's actually on, as you can see in this photograph, on a sort of abnormal area, you get a, a fluffy mold, white mold on this area. If you see mold directly on a wound, that's almost certainly mucormycosis. And that is effectively a medical emergency that needs to be, deal with, de to be dealt with. And as it progresses, it goes from white to dark, you get this black necrosis, and it gets bigger and bigger, and it extends much further than you can see usually as well. So that's a, a problem. And the margins appear to be sharply demarcated, but underneath the skin and in the subcutaneous tissues, you have further and more extensive disease. So one of the uncommon forms of mucormycosis is uh, gastrointestinal disease, as in this example, um, about 10% of cases of, of mucormycosis. This can occur in, in malnourished children, in low birth weight infants. Uh, it, it rarely a cause of CAPD um, a peritoneal dialysis and, and occasionally ketoacidosis, sort of acidotic type of patients as well. And you present with abdominal pain or distension, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, a little bit of blood in the stool, which are all not very distinctive features. And at um, surgery, because these patients deteriorate and then have an operation, you see these necrotic bowels, which are really quite severe. So they may be small bowel or maybe large bowel, and large areas of bowel are needed to be resected. And most of these patients don't survive, unfortunately, because it's usually the diagnosis is quite late in the course of disease. Now, primarily in India, there's a specific syndrome uh, called renal mucormycosis that's been described. And it can be a part of disseminated disease, or more commonly, it's just a kidney that's involved. Um, the patients are typically apparently normal, uh, immunocompetent patient without uh, any compromising factors, although sometimes they have diabetes and sometimes they have had a renal transplant. Um, it's more common in men. It's usually men in the prime of life. Uh, it's not necessarily um, in, in the elderly. And really, we don't understand the pathogenesis very well. It, it, it's obviously must be hematogenous, it must have spread by blood, but we don't really understand, for the most part, how it gets there. Uh, it's possible it's come up through the urinary tract, but it's unlikely because it tends to invade the blood vessels. And you get this extensive hyphalangio invasion, renal vessel thrombosis, uh, parenchymal necrosis, and so on. And that's a, it's a real, uh, it's quite a serious problem, and usually the kidney needs to be taken out. Now, a disseminated disease usually flows from a pulmonary focus. The spread is uh, hematogenous, um, and one of the key underlying risk factors is desferioxamine. Um, and, um, but you also get this in intravenous drug abusers as well. And you can typically present with cerebral disease, but you can have cutaneous disease or other organs affected. And it's really a, often diagnosed a little bit of a surprise on histology rather than it being actively sought as a, 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 a part of a clinical uh, syndrome because it's not got very many very distinctive features. But if you saw uh, a, a very ill patient with multiple pulmonary shadows in the context of uh, desferioxamine therapy, then this would be a key differential diagnosis. Now, this is an organism that uh, is found on tissue, a tissue biopsy. That is the gold standard. Swabs don't grow this organism very well. Um, the fungal stains for direct microscopy are very useful and very important. So either on sputum, on BAL, on sinus exudate, um, on skin lesions, uh, a direct microscopy is the fastest way to make the diagnosis and are really, really important. And if you have access to fluorescent brightness such as calcofluor, that will make it a little bit easier. Um, blood cultures are almost never positive and tissue cultures are often negative, even when you can see multiple hyphae on histology. There is PCR for this. Um, it's experimental still in the sense it's not an approved test, but it is quite useful. But it's also very useful for identifying the organism. What's really important is that the BTD glucan and galactamanan, 
or Asperger's antigen test are negative, completely negative. So in a patient with, for example, with a halo sign in neutropenia who looks like they might have aspergillosis but has negative glucan, negative galactomannan, this is quite likely to be mucomycosis. And if you then see this evolution of the uh, um, uh, reverse halo sign, then that's the diagnosis. And this is a patient that won't respond to voriconazole, for example, or itraconazole. So on the left here, you can see the uh, uh, one example of, of, of many where you have these broad, slightly irregular hyphae without septations. And uh, they're quite often a variable diameter. They're not all uniform. And on the right, you have the contrast with Aspergillus, where you've got a much more uniform hyphae um, with a 45 degree branching angle. And, and if you see that, then that's Aspergillus. And just to make life confusing, occasionally in neutropenic patients, you can have both infections together. So you really do need to look at all of the different pieces that you've got and see what you've actually got there. But the mucor uh, uh, features are fairly typical. So imaging, it relates to CT and MR scanning. And many of these patients need repetitive surgery and repetitive scanning if they uh, survive any length of time. And that's why MRI may be better. CT is sometimes better for the uh, bone destruction and looking at bones a little better. And it's it's, it's also very important for planning surgery to see the extent of disease uh, because obviously when you, if on the scan you can see how far you need to go in, but sometimes very extensive disease is, is very important. And the blood vessels and intracranial extension is probably better seen on MRI. Uh, and this is two examples of paranasal sinus acid mucormycosis. So you can see on uh, and slide A on the left here, this involvement of the maxillary sinus um, and on the right, the ethmoid sinus. And it's, um, it isn't, just does not look like a sort of little bit of mucus inside these uh, sinuses. This is a necrotic difficult area which is uh, clearly involved with something not which is unusual. And in this case, it happens to be mucor. So the treatments, there are three drugs that work and there's surgery that works. There's amphotericin, there's posaconazole, and the new agent is avuconazole. And surgery is a very important part of most patients. If you have disseminated disease, clearly surgery can't be used for most, most of the diseases. But for rhinocerebral disease, um, the surgical debridement is absolutely critical. For cutaneous disease, which is isolated, it's also critical. For renal disease, removing the kidney is also very important. And so early surgical intervention is associated with improved survival. A studies in pulmonary disease, if you've got unilateral disease in a neutropenic patient needing more chemotherapy, surgery is the answer for these patients, not waiting for the medical therapy to work. Um, and sometimes you need to take, there's a cerebral lesion and that le cerebral lesion needs to come out or partly come out and that's also helpful. Um, hyperbaric oxygen has been used and is in, helpful in some patients. And diabetic control is also, also thought to be really important. So controlling ketoacidosis and uh, um, the, the hyperglycemia is really important. And most of the time, more than one surgery is required. You do a piece of surgery and you can, during surgery, you can do frozen sections and the frozen sections can tell you if you've got clear margins or not, just as is done with cancer, to try and take the surgery as, as far as you can to resect as much disease as you can. So the complications are formidable, including obviously patients dying, which is a common problem. But in um, rhinocerebral disease, you've got neurological deficits, blindness, um, you've got stroke-like syndromes, loss of smell, cavernous sinus thrombosis, which itself is a very difficult disease, and internal carotid artery thrombosis. So these are very serious, difficult complications to handle. In the lungs, you get pulmonary thr uh, uh, thrombosis and infarction, and during a neutropenia or post-transplant, this may just progress. Um, in cutaneous disease, you get extensive spread, and if you've got, um, for example, a Burns patient with disease on their lower limb or their arm, you need to consider amputation early. If they've got disease on their trunk or their neck or their face, then it's obviously amputation isn't appropriate, and it's then debridement plus antifungal therapy. And if the patient survived gastrointestinal disease, then you can 
uh, then that's, that's good, but you may end up with a short gut syndrome because so much of the bowel has had to be removed. The prognosis is generally poor. Overall, it's around a 50% survival uh, of, of, of this disease. Clinical, um, the, the mortality depends on the clinical uh, form, which part of the body is infected and whether you have disseminated disease or not to some extent on the fungus and how susceptible it is, although there isn't a clear relationship between which fungus and which drug should be used. The, 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 the various different strains within the different families appear to be more or less susceptible, but testing isn't very good um, to tell you the answer to that. The severity of the disease is important. Controlling those underlying risk factors is very important and really good surgery is important. So this is a, a, a big team, multidisciplinary uh, effort to try and salvage these patients. You can see the outcomes here with mucomycosis and HIV, essentially no survivors described in the literature. Disseminated disease, very few survivors. Quite a variable response rate with rhinocerebral, which is partly related to how late this patient comes and how severe the disease is. Sinus disease, which is isolated without involving the brain, does better, but it's still only half the patient survive. Pulmonary disease does better if you can operate, but if it's bilateral, that's difficult. Cutaneous disease does best, and isolated renal mucomycosis is around a 35% um, survival uh, uh, mortality overall. So in summary, this is a, uh, an uncommon, aggressive, necrotizing infection. It probably affects more than 10,000 people, but it's pretty rare in many, many countries. Um, cerebral uh, or rhinocerebral uh, orbital mycomycosis is the commonest form of this disease. Um, radical surgery, antifungal therapy, correction of the underlying metabolic or immunological defects are very important. Some patients have other infections which need to be controlled. And survival's a little better if you have cutaneous disease, but it's pretty bad if you have disseminated disease. Many thanks.